I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And on behalf of our museum in New York and our partners at the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia, it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Thank you for joining us on Yom HaShoah or Holocaust Remembrance Day. We work hard to teach the history and lessons of the Holocaust every day, but today is a special occasion to step back and remember to honor the memory of those who perished at the hands of evil and to pay tribute to those who survived and have made a better world for all of us. With us today is Mark Schoenwetter, who truly embodies that spirit. Mark is a Holocaust survivor, the retired CEO of the Lieberfarb Jewelry Company and a member of the Museum Speakers Bureau, originally from Bzostek, <laughs> Bzostek Poland. Uh, Mark is here with his daughter, Ann Arnold, a CPA and businesswoman from New Jersey. Anne recently wrote Together, A Journey for Survival, which tells the story of Mark's experiences in Poland during the Holocaust. You can order your copy at the link in the Zoom chat. Anne will interview her dad today, and then we'll open the floor to audience questions. So please feel free to share questions and comments from Mark in the Zoom Q&A box throughout the conversation. Without further ado, thank you all for being here and welcome Mark and Anne. Thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you so much, Ari. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for having my dad and I on today. We hope you enjoy. We're gonna go through some questions and answers where we're going to hear a lot about my dad's experiences. But please, as Ari said, please let us know some questions that you may have that we don't get to, and hopefully we'll get to as many as we can. So to start, I'm going to just share my screen to give you a sense of where we're talking about. So dad, you were from a tiny village called Justek, and that's that red star right here. It's in the southeast corner of Poland. As you could see, it was surrounded by some of the concentration camps that many of you may be aware of, such as Auschwitz, Belgic, and Janowska. It's about a two hour drive southeast of Krakow. Can you describe to us your life and what it was like prior to the war and what your family did? Well, my parents lived in this little town of Brzostek for I don't know how many years back. My father had a farm and he has been the head of the Jewish community in the center. So our life like a farmer's life could be probably was whatever I could remember as a small, small child. People work on a farm during the day. They went out. I was playing in the garden. And life was basically normal life like everybody else farmers life. And then in 1939, when the war broke out, in the beginning, basically everything was more or less the same. And let me just say that in this little town, cons consisting of about 1,500 families, 500 families were Jewish families which lived there. So it was a very vibrant Jewish community. It seems like it was a big percentage of the population. Exactly. It was a pretty nice sized Jewish family there. And so when the war started, how did life change for you? Did it change right away or did it take a while? Well, in the beginning, normal, everything was continuing the same way as before. But after a certain period of time, maybe close to a year or maybe less or more, give it, times start changing. And what were the changes? That the Gestapo came to town, they went to the police station and they start asking how many Jews there and so far. And they were told that my father is the head of the Jewish community. So they came to him 
and they start asking him questions. And then after so often they used to come back and impose certain restrictions. First they said, all the Jews in town have to wear a band with the Star of David. Then they came and they said, all the Jewish kids should be taken out from public schools and they're not allowed to go to schools anymore. And then they came in and they told my father, you have to take your personal belongings, find yourself a room in town, and you're not going to live anymore in your house because we are taking it because we need this. So my father went, of course he did whatever it was told. We found the room and we lived in a Polish family house in one room. And that was the beginning of our life beyond our house. So then what happened? When did you have to start hiding or, or did you have to escape? What happened? Well, what was happening in between that they still were going and calling him to the police station. Well, why, would they, why would they call him to the police station? Well, they need some information, some questions. So they called them in and they let him go home. They called them in and they let him go home. To the point that at one day when they call him, he didn't show up anymore. My mom was kind of skeptical, scared. He is not home, what happened to him? But there's no way she could find anything out. So then she found out because somebody knocked on the door when she opened was the wife of the police chief. And she told my mom that she overheard the conversation between the Gestapo and her husband, and they were saying to him that soon in the next, whatever short period of time, they're going to take all the Jews out from this town somewhere. So I just want to let you know, and I suggest you take to your two kids and run away from this town. And so what happened? Did she run that night? Well, when she left, mom didn't know what to do. So let me go back for a step. On our property that we had our farm, which was pretty nice, big size farm. My father owned quite a bit of nice big house. And he gave two rooms to a Polish family, which used to help him, didn't work on, the, on his properties. So they lived there. So when mom was told about the Jews being taken, so she didn't know where to go. So she goes back to the house and she goes to this family, which name was Mr. Family Piwak. And she goes to him and she tells him the story, what she heard. So he says, well, it's pretty late in the evening. We're not going to figure out and do much at night now. So you go and sleep over in my house, a cousin's house. And you pointing at me, stay overnight in my house, sleep with my kids. And tomorrow morning, he tells my mom, I'm going to take and bring them over and then we talk and we decide what to do. So mom left. I went to sleep between the kids. Early next morning, the door opens, the Gestapo walks into the room 
they go to him and they tell him, get up and show us. Because we were told that the Sean Wetter family is in your house. So he looks at the Gestapo guy, he says, sorry, but he, they're not here. <laughs> so he looks at him and he says, listen, we're going to find them because take a look, I have people with me. They're going to search the property, but you're not cooperating. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to find them. And what we're going to do, we're going to kill them and you. So that's question, where are they? Don't waste my time. And he's insisting they're not here. So he tells his people, search, go and search the property. So they walking out, he's walking behind them. Then all of a sudden he stops by the door, he turns around and he sees all those kids sleeping on the floor. He turns to a, one of them, happened to be a girl, the older girl. And he says to her, can you tell me how many brothers and sisters you have? And she, without any hesitation, says seven. So he goes, he counts, and it's seven kids. Okay, so he walks out. Well, I was probably the luckiest kid in the world that she was smart enough to include me in the count. You really were. Yeah. So what did he make you do from there? Were you able, was he able to get you away from the Nazis looking for you? Well, he took me and we went to my mom and he tells my mom, listen, I think that the safest place for you would be if I take you and show you the ghetto there is here in next big town to us, which happened to be the name of the town Dembice, because the Polish police or the Gestapo from here, they wouldn't even think that you went to the ghetto. So you'll be safe. Well, you cannot hide here because you see they coming, they're going to search all over here for you. Over there, at least nobody will know you. So you're safe. It seems like That's things- how, Yeah, I'm sorry. You no, know, it seems like things got real, really quickly. I, I have to say, I remember one of the first times that we went back to Poland meeting that daughter that had saved you and how she still wore it as like a badge of honor. And she was so excited to tell us the story that that was me, I was the one who said it and all of her kids knew the story. It's quite amazing that she had the smarts to be able to do that. Exactly. She, she did yeah. it. But then, so then you got to the ghetto. What was life like in the ghetto when you got there? Well, when we walked into the ghetto, which was very easy to walk in, but you could never walk out. And we man, took both of us, me and my sister, my younger sister, and we start walking the streets looking for a location to live. Wherever we went to a house, there was no room, no space available. There were packed people who were like one on top almost of each other. And while walking the streets, looking for the location, we saw people living on a street, one next to each other. But somehow she found one house that had a little space on the attic. And we said, was enough room for three of us to sit there? And this was our place that we start to live. Well, after walking so many hours and everything, we were very hungry. So my mom is asking somebody next to us, can you tell me where I can get some food? 
person looks at her food. There is no food here. You cannot get anything. They will give you food. Wait for another hour or so. When you stay in line, they give you food. And that's it. That was the answer. Okay. No food. Nowhere to go. We wait. Time comes. Everybody goes out. Staying in line. When we get to the, uh, they call it kitchen, but it was like a stand. And when we got there, they say, okay, soup. And they gave us a, 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 a cup of soup, which actually the soup, when you look inside, was warm water. You felt like a little bit warm water in it and, and nothing inside, nothing, just the water. Then you make another couple steps and they gave you a slice of a dry piece of bread. Next. That was it, the food. Wow, that's the food. Yeah, that was the food. Didn't take too much time for us to finish this great food and continue to be hungry, but there was nothing else. And basically, day by day by day, we used to stay twice in the line, get this food, and that's what was, that's how we kept ourselves going. Well, of course, we got sick. We got lies. My mom cut our hair. We were dirty day and night because there was no clothes to change. We didn't have any clothes. So we were day and night again in the same clothes every day. There was no water to, to wash yourself even. And that's how we live in this ghetto. And we saw what was going on, how people that were dying, the, whoever couldn't survive those situations was dying. And whoever could survive, live, because you couldn't get any drugs any doctors or anything, because there was nothing like that there. So, you know, grandma, your, your mom was alone in this ghetto with two young children. I think you were nine and Aunt Sasha was maybe six or seven years old. How did you finally escape? How long were you there? And then how did you escape? Well, we were in this ghetto, I think it was about three months or so. And then there were rumors going on for a while that they will liquidate the ghetto, they will liquidate the ghetto, but nothing was happening. So, okay, people talk. But then one day a boy came to my mom and he says, I know you, you're the Schoenwetter, but there is a man on the other side of the fence and he mentioned your name, if anybody knows you. And I said, I don't. So sir, he tells me, go and bring, bring the Sean Wetter here. So mom goes and she looks, who is there, Mr. Piwa. And he tells to my mom, listen, make it fast. Go back, get your kids, come here, and I show you how to get from here out but quick, quick, quick. So my mom runs, picks me up and my sister, and he tells her, okay, he takes a, a blanket, throws over the barbed wire, and he says, okay, pick one kid at a time and throw him over. So mom says to him, I cannot do it. I'm weak. I don't have strength to pick up anything. He says, you do have strength. You pick him up and you throw him. You have strength. Take a look. Those two little kids, they skin and bone. There is no weight there. You can do it. Don't tell me you cannot do it. Go ahead. Pick. Quick. There's no time to play games here. So my mom goes and 
strength, strength, strength herself, gets as much strength that she can, throws my sister, then she throws me, and then he tells her, okay, you climb and you jump over and I catch you here. And that's how we got out from this ghetto. He took us to the house, it was a little house next to it. And he tells us, okay, get rid of your clothes because they're horrible. I have clothes here for you, you change. I have some food for you because you, I'm sure hungry, eat and we're going to go. I have a place for you to go. And that's how we got out from there, worked for a few hours, and we got to a village where he had the arrangements for us. So did you stay in that house that he brought to you for the rest of the war, or did you have to hide? I mean, what happened when you got there? How did you then survive? Well, when we got there, he introduced us and the lady looked at mom and she says, well, I see you have two little kids. Now, if I take you, are you promised that those two kids wouldn't talk, wouldn't laugh, wouldn't cry? They have to be quiet. I don't want to hear a sign, no sign from them. What do you do? Would you do that? Mom says, yes, I promise they will be right, be quiet. So she says, go on the attic. There's plenty of hay there, cover yourself with it. And you're going to stay there day and night. You're not going out anywhere. You're just staying there. I will come and I give you some food and that's it. And that's how we were staying there through the whole winter. So what would happen when the summer came? Well, when the late spring came, she came to my mom and she told her, okay, take your kids and you have to leave the house. I'm not holding you anymore. Mom says, but you ask me if we behave, you want to stay here. We didn't do anything wrong. Please hold us, I don't have where to go. So she says, I, I, I know you don't have where to go, but I'm afraid to hold you because the consequences may be bad for me and for you. So, but the only place I can tell you to go, why don't you go to the forest here? It's a very big forest. Go there, it's summertime, it's warm and you'll be okay. You live there. So we walked into the forest. We walked, my mom was walking around looking for a location when she found one between the bushes. The first thing she did, she says to us, okay, we have to go and look for some food. There are many things growing in the forest that we can eat. We just have to find them. So when we find them, you listen to me and listen good to me because I'm going to show you which food we can eat and which items we cannot eat because they are poison. So you have to learn, you have to keep your mind on it and I teach you, I show you. So for example, we found mushrooms. She says, oh, those are the good mushrooms. Remember, that's the way they look. Then we walk, then she found mushrooms. Oh, no, no, no. Those mushrooms are no good. They are poison. Don't you dare to take this. So she really taught you and Zasha how to forage and how to find what was good and what was bad. Exactly. Right. And same thing, there were berries or anything else. This good, this no good. This good, this no good. Plus, when we were living, she never stood in one place too long maybe a few days, and then she says, okay, we're going to change the location. And we move to another place and we start being there. So did we you were- ever, Did you uh, ever see other people when you were in the forest? At this beginning of time, we didn't see it yet. Okay. But she was showing us 
how to distinguish the sound if a human being walk in a forest or the animals walked, what kind of sound do you hear from the uh, from the leaves from this? And we learned those things, and we pre became pretty good in distinguishing. Now, if you're asking if there were other people, we did came across at one point of a group of Jewish people. And when they saw us, they, oh my God, a woman with two kids, why don't you join us and you stay together? It's so much better for you than to just be by yourself. It's so dangerous by yourself to be the stay in one. And mom listened and then she says, thank you so much, but I'm not going to go and stay in a big group because if we stay in a big group, somebody passes by, it's very easy to spot a big group. And then what? They're going to send the Germans here and that'll be the end of us. Thank you, you stay and I go back wherever I am. And just to continue this part of it in one of the time what happened, at one point, we did start hearing early in the morning shoot, shout, shoots, shooting. And my mom took us and we start running wherever we heard the shooting. And we were this kind of surprised, mom, why are you going there? They're shooting here. Just follow me and just listen to me, make sure that do whatever I tell you. We have to go behind where they are. Because if we stay, go forward, she tells, they will see that we were here so we probably escape forward. We're not going to go back and then I will catch up. So let's go back behind somewhere there. We have to find a way to go behind it. And that's what we did. That's what mom did. And then after a few hours, we came to the location back to see what's happened. Oh, there was about 20 something people. They were all dead. It's amazing the instincts she had to even think, because I think I would have just gotten up and run. I never would have thought to have to run towards the gunfire to try to get around it, to avoid it. it it's amazing her instinct, it really always amazed me. So what happened when it would get cold? Did you stay in the forest or did you have well, to find the location? The, the way it was going, so let me just say in general, summers, this summer, the next summer, and the following summer, we were staying and hiding in the forest. Now, winter times, we couldn't stay in the forest because, I mean, winter, snow, freezing, cold. So, what we did at night, mom was walking to some villages and asking for place to stay if they can take us in. And usually if they took us for a week or two, we were lucky, then we had to go to another place. And while we were doing that, she finally couldn't get any place. So she went back to our little town and she went to one of the families that, that there was, my, my family was very close with them. And she all told them, you know, I don't have where to go. Can you, can you hide me? So they say, okay, I take you, but listen, you in town, it's dangerous here. I take you for a week, maybe or less, but you have to go and start looking for a different location. So we stood there for a week, let's say, then at night she would leave by herself and walk around places to find a location. When she found that, she came, she took us and we went there. And usually the winter time, we were staying in somebody attics or some uh, barn and that's how we were hiding. And one time when we were hiding in this 
town, in our town, and this family's name was Jejits. In their house, we, we were sitting on the edit. So dad, let me just correct, let me just make sure. So just for everyone to see, the attic, this is the actual attic you were hiding. Yeah, that's why, yeah, yeah. And this is the house where it was the attic on. Right. So one time, like we hear, like you see the opening and you see the step ladder. Right. We hear that somebody climbs on top and we heard the voices and we know those are Germans. And we were hiding here when it says the attic. Right. The hay. But the hay was full. Here it's a little only, but that time it was full with hay. So the German guy came upstairs and there was a pick fork on the side by the door there. A pitchfork, right? Pitchfork. Yeah. And he took it and he started hitting it in the hay, walking around and hit it in all different places. Because he figured if somebody is there, if he hits him, they're going to scream. And he got him. And somehow, I don't know how, he didn't hit us. Wow. It was what a miracle. It was. What's some other unusual places that you had to hide? Another unusual place we were hiding at one winter, the following winter, we walked, mom walked into a farmer and he says, okay, I, I, I feel bad for you. I feel sorry. I figure out something, but give me some time to make a decision what I want to, how, how, where I want to put you in. So he goes and he says, come back in a day or so. And let me see what I can do. So when, of course, we came close, quick back. And he says, okay, I think I have a place for you. Come on, I show you. He takes us and brings us into a pigsty. And he says, you see, I dig a hole inside this pigsty here. But as you look at the hole, it's very shallow. Not even sit, you wouldn't be able here. So if you think you'd be comfortable to be there and just to lay down, then you stay here, I take you. So mom says, no big deal, I do it, we do it, we do it. So that's what it, then he says, okay, walked in, step into it. We stepped in, we lay down. He takes pieces of wood, puts on top of it, covers the whole thing up. Then he puts hay on top of this and brings the pigs in and how that's how we start living in this location. We lived, we were lucky because we lived through the whole winter like that. We didn't have to walk in the snow, freeze and look for a location. We were just sitting there as bad, uncomfortable and horrible it was, but at least we had a place and we felt to a degree comfortable that we can live here. And that's how we survived one of the other winters. So you were pretty close to that animal, I will say that. That's yes. Too close. You know, it's amazing when you were in the forest, you really didn't encounter many wild animals or have too much of an encounter with that. It seemed like it was almost when you would think you wouldn't, which was the winter, that's when you encountered the animals more. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And so how long did you live like that? Like, I know that you were in the forest for a while, but then obviously, how did you get liberated? Were you in the forest or did you eventually have to leave the forest or the hiding? Well, in 1944, in the summer, then we went back to the forest and it was late beginning of the fall already. We all of a sudden start hearing explosions from far away. 
And then we start hearing them closer and closer and closer. So my mom decided we cannot stay anymore in the forest. So he took, she took us and she says, okay, we have to get out from here somewhere, go. I don't know where, but we have to find a way. Let's see what's going on. And we start moving out deeper and deeper towards the villages further away from the sound of the explosions. And while we were doing it, we noticed that people, Polish farmers were escaping the front lines and there were groups of people passing. So my mom says to us, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to follow those groups, stay in the back, and you two don't talk. Any questions you get or something, don't answer. You kids, you don't have to say anything. And your names are going to be changed. And she gave us Polish names and she told us what a name she's going to have in Polish. Now those are our names. And finally, we were lucky enough that one of the farmers took us in and we lived with this farmer through the winter. And then in 1945, some times in February, all of a sudden everything quieted down and then we hear, we see some soldiers walking. We didn't know who the soldiers are or anything. So when they got to the house, they start speaking a language that we didn't understand. One of them finally says, he knows a little Polish and he says in Polish to us, we are the Soviet army. We liberated you, you're free, you can go home, wherever you are from, there's no more Germans in the area, you save, go home. Wow, I mean, you, at least you knew you hopefully didn't have to live on the forest floor and, and sleep on leaves and branches anymore and you know, I know I'm sure it took an emotional toll on all of you knowing how everybody risked their lives for you. I know grandma knew the implication of people hiding you and how dangerous it was for everybody. So how, when this was over and you heard you were liberated, how did it make you feel? Well, it's a good question. How would make us feel? It make us feel uh, uh, it, 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 it's hard to describe the feeling, how you were free. You kind of thought, oh, I am free. I don't have to probably starve anymore. I don't have to be afraid of anything. I can go and live my life and not to look behind me and see what's going on, who is there. It was such a good feeling that you can imagine. So just let me give you a small comparison, which is, isn't a comparison, but a feeling, a, a, a matter of a feeling. You see today, we have the COVID-19 and families didn't see their kids one family didn't see the other for a year because they were afraid that if something, you get the virus. So you're lucky enough that they discovered the vaccine, you get one shot, you get another shot. Now you got two shots. Then you ask your kids, did you get your shots? Yes, we got the, sh the shots. Wow. Now we can go and get together. 
Finally, finally, after a year not seeing each other, we can get together and I can give you a hug and a kiss. What kind of feeling did you have? Wasn't that a great feeling for you that you could finally meet the, your kids or the kids could meet you? Now you ask me how my feeling was. We left the farm, went back to our house. The house is destroyed. The front line went through. Empty. Not many people because people escaped the front line. Not many people. So we see the day or two, we live there. Nobody comes back. There is nobody there. We wait another week passes by or so. Nobody here coming. I don't see my father coming and give me a hug and a kiss. So you see, as much as it was the feeling, the freedom and everything, but you had also the feeling what happened. So, so you never saw your father again, what happened? So I never saw my father again. You know what happened to him? What we were told was, let me just tell you what we were told. After we were, we escaped, a few days later, whatever, the Germans came to town and they told, they requested Polish men to go to work. They took him on trucks and they brought him into a forest. And they told him to dig a big hole. After they were done with digging all this big hole, they took him back to town. And then they came back for them and they told them, we need you back to work. So they went. When they came back to the same location they took him, all of a sudden they saw that this big hole that they did, it's packed, it's full with dead bodies. So they told him to cover the whole thing up nicely. They did the job. And after that, they told them, okay, there are items here. Take one item for the work that you did. Go ahead, take one item. So there was this one guy in between that used to work for my father. And he went, look around, and he noticed those pair of shoes. And he says, oh, those shoes I know. And he put those shoes on. Because he knew that those shoes belonged to my father while he was working, he knew him. And that's what he told the story to my mom. And that's how we found out that my father was murdered in, in, its, in this big uh, mass grave in this particular forest. Uh, just for everyone to see, they discovered the mass grave in 2011. A hiker was hiking through the forest and saw a piece of stone sticking out from the ground, which is this piece of stone in the upper right. And they realized that people anonymously must have gone back afterward and marked that grave with the hope that somebody would find it one day and these people's lives would not have been lost in vain. And they've made a memorial of it. We had an opportunity to visit it. And it is pretty deep there in the forest, but it's quite amazing that we were actually able to find that mass grave. So thank you that, I know it's not easy talking about that. So how long did you stay in Poland? I mean, how, how did you leave Poland? Well, we stood in Poland till 1957. And from the time we were liberated to the time that we left, we lived in this town named Tarnów, which was a little 
nice size of a town. And we went there to school. Me and my sister went to school there. We graduated high school there. Then my sister went to the university there. I went to, and then in 1957, there was a change in the Polish government. It was a communist regime, right? Yeah, we lived at this period of time, Poland was a communist okay. regime. Right. Yeah. Okay. And we, one day there was a change in the government and the new leader of the Communist Party became some little better guy than the other, probably. And he and they announced that they will allow Jewish people to leave Poland and go only to Israel if they will go through uh, 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 what you call it, go through certain restrictions they put down and they're going to investigate if everything is okay with them, they behaved, they will get a permit to leave. And we applied, we got the permit and we went to Israel. And in 1957, we arrived in Israel. Got it. And I know from there you came to America in 1961 when you were sponsored by some relatives that were here. Right, exactly. So throughout this whole thing, how did your mother keep your hope alive? And did you keep the traditions of the Jewish, like what are your religious beliefs? Did she keep that alive? Well, you have to understand that during this period of time, that when we start hiding till we been liberated, we didn't know anything about religion. There was no opportunity or anything to think about the religion or to live with the religion. We didn't know when is day, we knew only when is day and night, but we didn't know if this is uh, sometimes Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever. And then when we live under the communist regime again, we didn't obey because there was no religion. There wasn't even many Jews, I don't think. And there was not, besides there were not many Jews right. and there was no uh, possibility to live under the religion. So I didn't actually didn't have any religious education. So I just live our, my life, we live, you know, without the religion. Though, if you ask me, later on, after I came to Israel and I came to the United States, I start observing the Jewish traditions. Mm -hmm. More the Jewish traditions than going back to the study right. religion. And, and grandma kept her hope alive and she was such a positive, always taught you and, and Zasha to be just so positive. That's what I always took away from it is how positive you were your whole life. And it, it's amazing to me and my sister Isabella, just, we always talk about, it. it's amazing that you go through something like that and you guys could be so positive and, and see that. Yeah. You know, we had a question that was asked and, and I have to say, ask me if there was much anti-Semitism that you experienced before the war or any of your neighbors that experienced that kind of anti-Semitism. And I will say that when I was researching for the book, one of the things I realized is in this small little part of Poland, the Galicia region it's called, it was actually known as a very um, harmonious area where there wasn't that much anti-Semitism. Do you remember feeling any anti-Semitism or hearing from your mother that there was anti-Semitism before the war? Honestly saying, I never heard anything my mom saying, and I even didn't know for years after that what anti-Semitism meant. Amazing. You know, I, I remember when we went back, 
we went back to Poland, I'm going to share my screen again here, in 2009, and the, the town just did, not only did they welcome us, but they put a plaque on town hall commemorating the memory of the Jewish community. And then this town also had a ceremony with over 600 people where they reconsecrated a Jewish cemetery. And they put a concert on for us where they started singing in Hebrew and they really welcomed us into their arms. And it was a very, for me, a life-changing experience which motivated us to start our own journey. But I know we're getting close to the end here. And I, I'd like to ask you, Dad, now that we've written the book and you go out and you speak to students with my sister and myself, and you speak to adults of all ages, what is the message that you wanna impart on everybody that hears you speaking? You know, is there a, a, a lesson that you have learned throughout all of this that you would like to share with everybody? Well, the message, Usually, sometimes a message is a very simple thing. The hard thing about it is that people don't follow it. You see, the message is that there were six million people that during Jewish people met, killed, murdered in this period of time. Don't forget, there was also another 5 million people who were killed, which were Romans, lesbians, anything who was against Hitler, like the Jews, then the other ones, they were not Aryan people, they were killed. So in our town, where I came from, there were 1,500 people from which 500 were Jewish families. And you know what was left after this whole thing? Maybe 10, 12 or something people from which three of us were, my mom, my sister, me. Everybody was killed. So the message here is we have to remember what happened in this period of time. So this way we can prevent in the future from happening anything like it again. Because I learned in my life that you can accomplish much more with kindness, with love to each other, with respect to each other than with hatred. Hatred is going to create more hatred. And this creates more hatred. And what does this bring you by the end? It could bring you to a disaster. Do we need this? Do we live in such a short period of time? So let's enjoy it our life because we all the same, regardless if we Christians, Muslims, Jewish, Hindu, or whoever other religion there is, we all the same. It makes a difference if one is black, the other one is white, the other one is brown. Why are we distinguishing this? We're just human beings living on this earth. So why we live here, why don't we live in peace, in harmony with each other? As I said before, and I'm going to say again, we can accomplish much more and be so much more happy when we can grab somebody, give him a hug and a kiss, than to go and try to kill him. Very true. Thank you, Dad. Well, I, I wanna thank everyone. I know there's some more questions that we were not able to get through and I'm, I apologize, the time is running out. 
If you do want to reach out to us, Ari will let you know we are online on social media, both on Facebook and on Instagram at Together A Journey for Survival or at the foundation that my sister and I have started in my father's honor, the Mark Schoenwater Holocaust Education Foundation, where we are hopefully paying it forward by giving grants to schools that would like to bring education into their curriculum. So Ari will let you know, and a lot of the questions also are in the book. So I hope that you'll be able to get those answered. And Ari, thank you again so much for having us. It was wonderful and take it away. Mark, it's been amazing to listen to your story. I'm, I'm struck by the, the courage and strength of your mom um, and also of the how many righteous Gentiles uh, risked their own lives in order to save your family. It's an extremely touching story and I can't think of a better message to, to leave us with on Yom HaShoah. So thank you for being with us. And Anne, thank you so much for facilitating and interviewing. Um, today's program was recorded and we'll share a link to the recording in an email tomorrow, along with links to order the book, uh, a link to the Mark Schoenwetter Education Foundation and some other suggested resources. So to everyone watching, we thank you for being with us today on behalf of the Museum of Jewish Heritage and our partners at the National Museum of American Jewish History. And uh, we wish everyone a nice and safe and meaningful afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, and I, before we go, I should also mention um, our Yom HaShoah commemoration is this Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern, the annual gathering of remembrance. Um, we'll feature several Holocaust survivors, including members of our Speakers Bureau, as well as remarks from Chuck Schumer, Second Gentleman Doug Emhoff, uh, Alicia Wiesel, who's the son of the late Nobel laureate Ellie Wiesel, and others. So it'll be a very meaningful commemoration. Um, it's our way as a New York community of, of honoring Yom HaShoah. And we hope that those of you watching will join us. I uh, will include a link to that as well in the follow-up email and it is in the Zoom chat right now. Thank you all for being a part of our community, for hearing Mark's story and uh, take care.